Hello all. Boop. Um, here's some real cool looking plants. And I'm going to expand on this throughout my talk. So um, I'll start with a little bit of fun audience participation. Can anyone tell me what um, this is? No clues? Yeah, pineapple. So um, it is a pineapple. It's uh, originally from Guadalupe and it came to Europe in the 1600s. But why is it here? Uh, why is it everywhere? Why was it a summer trend 2014? Why, do, why are these cycle shorts so cool? So, um, because when the pineapple was first brought to Europe, uh, it was associated with like long ship journeys that would be really expensive and dangerous. So when it came to England, like only very super rich people could afford them. Um, and they would have them as an accessory at their hairs as, as a status symbol. Um, it would also later become associated with good hostess skills or hosting skills. Um, but so sought after was the accessory of a pineapple that like you could not, if you couldn't afford to buy and eat one, you could just rent one <laughs> and then give it back to the pineapple sailor man and he'd resell it for someone to eat it. So, um, and later it's it, like, it kind of integrated itself into architecture and our culture. And you might notice this when you look around you. There, there it is in some buildings. So it's also atop the Wimbledon trophy. Um, and it's on wallpapers. And it basically just like, stemmed from people wanting to show that they're good hosts by having really expensive pineapples um, from, from the discovery of the new world. So, um, and sometimes they took a little bit too far. <laughs> um, so uh, speaking of taking things too far, I don't know if you've ever noticed that the national flower of Holland is tulip or it's on all their kitsch and garb um, and like clogs and stuff. Um, and so that's because uh, when botan botanists were trading bulbs after the fall of the Silk Road in Constantinople and stuff, or after the beginning of the Silk Road trading after the fall of Constantinople, um, bulbs were traded around Europe in a very swanky fashion by like cosmopolitan cool botanists like me. Um, and uh, when they first got to the Netherlands, there was only one person who had them in his garden and they were like a, they were a secret. Uh, and someone broke in and robbed them and then they were in super high demand. So they became extraordinarily expensive. And it's actually in economics textbooks, an example of a stock market crash called tulip mania because they became extraordinarily expensive and people traded like houses and dairies and windmills and clogs and stuff uh, probably for <laughs> like uh, for tulip bulbs and especially one kind which um, Rembrandt drew and it's called Augustus Semper and it looks like this and it has this marbled mottled feathery um, pretty look to it and that's because um, like they were like one in a hundred and we didn't know why one might look like this and some don't so people would like crave these ones and then get huge money for them um, and we only found out later, much later, that that was because of this mite that lives in peach trees. Oh, whoops, <laughs> nothing there to see. Um, and, uh, and because of this mite, it actually infects the bulb and then that causes that marbled like look, which is like fascinating because generally natural selection does, like selects for things that are stronger or make them survive more. But it, curiously, this is a mosaic virus that came from a mite that infects like trees and bulbs. So it actually made it weaker. But because like humans are so fond of aesthetics, we were like, this one's the best. We must propagate this one more. So it's a fascinating alternate for what usually happens. Whoopsie. Um, so another thing we didn't realize until we had microscopes, because we only found out about the mosaic virus in the early 1900s, um, 300 years after tulip mania, uh, basically was that we could see lots and lots of things we couldn't see before. Uh, and part of that were algae. And algae are like plants of the sea, like seaweed. Um, and a microscopic form of algae is called a diatome. And it's really, really microscopic. And um, it's a single cellular thing that's made with like a silica and water wall, um, which kind of gives it this crystalline structure. But we couldn't even see those until we found microscopes. But when we did find microscopes, we started, <laughs> the Victorians were like, these are fun. Let's make them look really cute. And they arranged them. And they would kind of just spend hours, microscopists would spend hours just arranging these like tiny little structures, which are like uh, generally bilaterally symmetrical, which is they're called diatom, because it's like diatom, and it makes it in two. And that porous quality of the walls as well is actually very unique and fascinating. Those are like 50 microns apart, which is like the thickness of one of your hairs. And what's great about them is that they um, 
and give it its structural integrity as well. So if it was completely smooth on the outside, it would also be 60% less like strong. And so the thing that makes it really beautiful and fascinating and fun for Victorian ladies to play with is also what makes it strong and makes such a pretty <laughs> Christmas tree. Um, with I don't. So yeah, um, and it's another example of how human aesthetic preference kind of like made something more widespread or popularized. Um, so I think that is about it. Yeah. Um, but a final note. It's an interesting is that botany is kind of the butt of all the jokes in the sciences. Everyone's always saying, oh, like, oh I want to pass my exam, so just do botany. There's no knowledge in it. And um, in England, like in 2009, out of the 37,000 university level students who were subscribed to sciences, only 19 of them are doing pure botany. So uh, just like a little reminder that it's uh, it has always been badass and it still is. So thank you. Yeah.